morning. Um, for those who, of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Greenup. I'm chief of breast surgery and uh, newly named co-director of the Smilo Breast Program. And I have the honor today of introducing Dr. Megan King. Um, Dr. King is an associate professor of cell biology and of molecular, cellular, and development biology. She's also the co-leader of radiobiology and genome integrity research program at the Yale Cancer Center and an associate cancer center director for basic science. She did undergrad at uh, Brandeis and then went on to receive her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biophysics from the University of Pennsylvania under the mentorship of Dr. Mark Lemon and uh, went on to get a postdoc training with uh, at Rockefeller University where she discovered new mechanisms for the targeting and function of integral inner nuclear membrane proteins. Um, since founding her own group in 2009, Megan has continued to investigate the broad array of biological functions that are integrated at the nuclear envelope from impacts on DNA repair to nuclear and cellular mechanisms. Um, she was named a SIR scholar in 2011 and is the recipient of the NIH New Innovator Award and is currently an Allen Distinguished Investigator. Um, she's been at Yale for 15 years and we're excited to hear about her work today. So thank you, Dr. King. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think, um, you know, hearing that bio, it always reminds me of how far I've come to what I'm going to be talking about today and how much that is a consequence of the environment um, at Yale and the interactions that really have been driven initially by joining what was then the radiobiology and genome and, and radiobiology and radiotherapy research program, um, which was connected to me by Patrick Sung, who's no longer here, but he kind of immediately roped me um, into that program and then all of the relationships I made uh, through that, um, particularly with Joanne Sweezy um, and Pat LaRusso. And really it's that transition that has really spurred everything that I'm going to talk about today. And so I'm really appreciative of that because I think it's really kind of broadened the, the scope of where this fundamental biology, which hopefully you'll see today about the nuclear envelope, is really related to a, you know, a, a chemotherapy approach that's being broadly used and which we're hoping could be used in even more contexts. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about um, today. And then the surprise to us has been a connection between this and innate immune signaling, which is also not our area of expertise. And so I really appreciate anyone here online now, later um, thoughts on that because um, there's so many people at Yale who do have more expertise in that area than we do. Okay, so um, just my disclosure, some of this work is funded through the Strategic Alliance with AstraZeneca. So um, as, as many of you are familiar with, PARP inhibitors are really the canonical example of synthetic lethality. And this is such a powerful concept because it really highlights how we might use approaches that are really specific to tumor cells and otherwise do not affect all the normal cells of the body and, and what a you know, fabulous approach right, that, that would be. Um, and so the idea is that um, PARP inhibitors um, in particular cause uh, single-stranded DNA damage to persist, or at least that's one of the mechanisms that we think about as being important here. And that typically cells can tolerate this kind of damage because they have a functional homologous or combination DNA repair mechanism that can act in S and G2 and repair these breaks. And this leads to cell survival. However, in the consequence of defects and homologous recombination, and kind of the classic example of this are pathogenic mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, there's a defect in tolerating this damage, and this will lead to, to cell death, right? And so this is the mechanism where it's the combination of the HR defect and the PARP inhibitor that drives uh, tumor cell death. So I wanna just set the stage for what I'm going to talk about today by, by reminding you about how P53 works, um, because I'm gonna use this as an example of, of um, or kind of framework for thinking about the story that I'm going to tell today. So in interphase, in normal cells, right? We have, when there's DNA damage, there is the activation of P53. And P53 is, is really this decision point. It's both activating mechanisms to um, repair that dam damage, right? So the first response of the cell is to try to tolerate and repair this damage, stall the cell cycle, fix the genome, and then go into mitosis and, and, and have normal cell growth. Um, but 
um, but if this damage is too deleterious, if it persists, if it can't be tolerated, then this is going to lead to a, 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 the stimulation of apoptosis. And so really this is this combination of repair and then when we can't repair driving um, cell death. However, you know, we know that this is a mechanism that is dysregulated in the vast majority of tum tumors, including those that respond to PARP inhibitors. And so this is not the mechanism, right? So we know we can get the synthetic lethality of PARP inhibitors with HR defects, even in the context of dysregulated P53. Um, so what is this mechanism actually? And you might think that we understand this mechanism, but what I'm gonna tell you about today is that we, we don't. And I'm gonna to focus today, a uh, disclaimer on the tumor cell intrinsic mechanisms. Um, that is not to negate the fact that there are other roles for the immune system, for the tumor microenvironment. But what we know is that in, in HR deficient cells, in a dish, PARP inhibitors can cause cell death. So we know that there is at least a sufficiency in, in cells and culture um, for a tumor cell intrinsic mechanism um, of cell death. Um, and it, and and how do we think about what kind of surveillance mechanisms might be akin to P53 that, that drive this? Um, so I just wanna highlight a few of the challenges that we face in the use of PARP inhibitors, because really this is our motivation for the kind of fundamental studies that I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, it's very clear that PARP inhibitors specifically kill HR deficient cells, but we don't understand the cell death mechanism as I already highlighted. Um, acquired resistance is a major challenge, um, and it's really well explored in preclinical models through things like CRISPR screens, um, but actually the insights from patient samples is really still rather limited, and it, understanding the cell death mechanism that PARP inhibitors precipitate would really help in, in, in this area. Um, a major challenge is that we lack um, a robust biomarker that can tell us that PARP inhibitors are likely to be effective. So this can either be that cells have reconstituted homologous recombination, or there could be other contexts outside of the genetic kind of germline mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2, or even somatic mutations, where it could be there is an HR defect that's actionable, but because we don't have a biomarker for HR status that is at least dynamic, right? There are kind of sequencing-based approaches, but we don't have a classic kind of pathological, straightforward cytology kind of approach, and that's a real limitation. Um, and, and lastly, there's a lot of enthusiasm about combining PARP inhibitors with immune checkpoint blockade, and an, indeed a number of trials that are exploring this. Um, but we don't actually understand the underlying mechanisms of why those combinations might be effective. And to really understand that, we have to understand how, how PARP inhibitors are working. And, and this is why we're really interested in the crosstalk I'll talk about today with the innate immune system and how that might be uh, contribute to the, the rationale for these combinations and might point to what the right approaches are. Um, so as I said, I'm gonna focus on this um, cell death mechanism in my talk today. And to first to introduce um, how we've kind of, how we've been thinking about this problem, I want to just introduce you to this canonical um, innate immune surveillance mechanism uh, in which CGAS shown here is the, a really key player. So CGAS is an innate uh, immune sensor protein that is in the cytoplasm of cells and it binds to double-stranded DNA. And the idea is that it can surveil for viruses and bacterial pathogens, but there's increasing evidence that CGAS is also capable of surveilling um, self DNA that's present within cells, within eukaryotic cells themselves. So for example, a dysregulated mitochondria can lead to leaking of mitochondrial DNA into the cytoplasm, which can activate CGAS. And today I'm gonna to be talking about how actually the chromosomes or the chromatin or DNA from the nucleus can be exposed and surveilled by CGAS. Um, CGAS works by when it binds to DNA, um, just I'm going to say very clearly when it binds to naked DNA, this drives a change and, and molecules of CGAS come together and they produce this second messenger called CGAMP. Um, but actually binding of CGAS to DNA does not always lead to this response. And so there's regulation of this that I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. So just recruiting CGAS somewhere does not mean that it's actually producing this second messenger, but the second messenger is thought to be key to its downstream mechanisms. 
The recipient of the CGAMP signal um, is Sting. Sting is a membrane protein that is key to the canonical uh, signaling pathway that CGAS activates. And that is by driving the phosphorylation of a kinase called TBK1 once it's trafficked to the Golgi. And then this phosphorylates IRF3, which is a transcription factor that when phosphorylated goes into the nucleus and drives um, interferon stimulated gene expression. So that's the kind of canonical pathway. There's also a non-canonical roles in activating NF-kappa B signaling. And, and, and any of these may, in addition to inflammatory genes, cause apoptosis. So this could be a mechanism that can drive cell death, although we really don't understand this terribly well. In addition, um, Sting is also involved in some other non-canonical mechanisms that could also precipitate cell death, which as I mentioned, is what I'm gonna be focusing on today. And part of this actually involves the autoph an autophagy mechanism. So there appears to be some autophagy dependent cell death mechanism downstream of Sting. And this is independent perhaps of this canonical interferon stimulated gene signaling. Um, and so while I'm gonna focus kind of on these upstream steps today, um, we really don't know what the key downstream steps um, are in terms of which signaling pathways are gonna be most, most relevant. And so that's really kind of ongoing work. And I'll just close with this slide by um, highlighting that actually a CGAS is a really ancient protein. It actually goes all the way back to prokaryotes. And so it's played a role in surveilling foreign DNA long before the innate immune system. And so that kind of makes sense, this idea that it's actually multiple signaling pathways that lie downstream of CGAS activation. Um, so, so how do we get thinking about innate immunity? Um, there's abundant evidence um, in the literature that HR defects on this, in this particular case, um, on the left, we're looking at BRCA, in both these cases, we're looking at BRCA2 knockdown models, um, that HR defects are sufficient to trigger an innate immune response. And this is a response that's actually further pushed by the addition of PARP inhibitors. Um, so let me just walk you through the example of this data. As I mentioned, this is BRCA2 knockdown cell. So with doxycycline, we have suppression of BRCA2 expression. And you can see that there's a gain in IRF3 phosphorylation, which is one of that canonical downstream outcomes of CGAS signaling. And this also leads in this model to STAT1 phosphorylation. Um, and a similar thing is seen in the in, in breast cancer cells in this 231 model. Again, this is an artificial system with a knockdown of BRCA2. Um, with regards to how PARP inhibitors then synergize with this, I've just pulled out this data um, from BRCA1 deficient, uh, BRCA1 deficient breast cancer line that's commonly used in the lab to study a BRCA1 deficiency. And this is now in a xenograph model. So these are actually uh, mouse xenografts looking at how PARP inhibitors affect interferon stimulated gene expression. And you can see that all of these genes that are downstream of CGAS activation are upregulated in the PARP, with PARP inhibitor treatment in this xenograph model. Um, so there's been these observations of innate immune stimulation in the context of HR deficient cells that's further pushed by PARP inhibitors um, in a number of cases. But what is the cause of this, right? So what the, what the signal is, how we go from HR deficiency to innate immune signaling has been really unclear. Um, one other thing that I want to just alert you to is that when there is an HR defect in cells, one of the consequences is that we accumulate, cells accumulate mitotic errors. Um, so this is just one paper I've pulled out from Steve West actually from more than a decade or probably more than 15 years ago now. Um, where it's been recognized for a long time, if there are challenges in maintaining integrity of the genome, then in mitosis, you have these intermediates that lead to persistent bridges of DNA and DNA breaks, and these kind of breakage fusion, fusion breakage cycles that can actually be precipitated by an HR defect, by irradiation, by taxol treatment. So you can arrive at these kinds of structures in many ways, but I would say HR deficiency is not the way that most people have thought about arriving um, at these kind of structures. Um, I also just want to remind you, because I'm a cell biologist, um, that actually the nuclear envelope, um, not only uh, the nuclear envelope is breaks down every cell cycle. Okay, so I just wanted to keep this in your mind too as I talk about this because I just told you there's an innate immune surveillance protein that is looking for DNA. 
And yet every mitosis, the chromosomes are exposed to the cytoplasm. So we, we know that that's not sufficient to drive an innate immune response. So we know in mitosis, there are mechanisms to downregulate down this surveillance mechanisms or way to shield these chromosomes from actually activating this pathway. And so these um, recombination intermediates are interesting in part because they don't just occur in mitosis, they persist into the following interphase. And that's going to be important here because we need to get to the next interphase in order for this innate immune surveillance mechanism to be reactivated. And indeed, there is also evidence in the literature that for PARP inhibitors to actually induce cell death, cells have to transit through mitosis. This is additional evidence that, you know, unlike P53, which as I mentioned is acting in interphase, that it is essential for cells to go through mitosis for PARP inhibitors to actually cause cell death. This is actually some work, again, in a xenograft model in the absence of functional BRCA2 and cells treated with elaparib. And what you can see is kind of these events. So we have a, a cell that is uh, likely in G2, it goes into mitosis. You can see this is, an, this is an anaphase. So there are anaphase bridges here. And actually most cells have some degree of entanglement of chromosomes in anaphase that are gonna be resolved dynamically. However, if that does not happen, if cells are unable to resolve these entanglements of chromosomes, what happens is that these cells will biochemically come out of mitosis. So they're back in interphase and you can see that because the nucleus is intact again. Um, but what you can see in this cell is you now have a doublet essentially, right? You have a cell that actually failed in cytokinesis and it failed because you couldn't actually generate two cells because there was bridging DNA between these two cells, but the cell has biochemically come back into interphase. And so we can imagine that the innate immune system is active again. And the question is, is this somehow aware of the fact that this is a defective mitosis? Is there some mechanism to know that and that this would ultimately drive the cell death? And that's what we see happening on the right with this chromosome condensation. Um, I just wanna highlight that this is not really new information. Um, so we can go back, this is from 2001, um, and there has been long been the understanding that these changes in nuclear shape, nuclear atypia, which are used all the time by pathologists to diagnose and stays cancers are tied to these kind of aberrations um, that I've mentioned. Um, so I just want to, you know, they've been called many things over time. What I want to point out is that all of these kind of mitotic errors that are typically associated with altered nuclear shape are all things that we're observing in interphase cells. Again, so not in cells, just in mitosis that have an anaphase bridge, but they're in, um, in interphase. So these were called, uh, what the structures that I just described, that you can have persistent DNA that then uh, is still there as cells reform their nucleus and go into the next cell cycle. Um, and this, you know, 25 years ago, were called internuclear strings. Um, but you can also have micronuclei. And I just want to point out one of the differences between these two types of structures is that these internuclear strings are because of an inability to segregate the chromosomes because the chromosomes are literally entangled and cannot be physically segregated. Micronuclei are different and that they predominantly arise from lagging chromosomes acentrosomal chromosome fragments and perhaps extra chromosomal DNA, right? So they really are a different structure than th these two structures are actually quite different and I'll come back to that. The consequence of this can lead to binucleation. That's what I just showed you in that particular BRCA2 model. Um, and I won't really talk about it today, but you can also get nuclear ruptures that happen in interphase due to a defect in the nuclear integrity, uh, but that is not an event that's tied to mitosis. So I'm not gonna talk more about that um, today. Okay, so let me just show you kind of the amazing cell biology that is tied and specifically to these persistent DNA bridges. Um, so here I'm showing you um, a movie. These are cells that are expressing a nuclear localization signal tagged to a fluorescent protein. So it's exclusively in the nucleus. And we're gonna look at this cell that is just going through mitosis, if it will. Hmm. Maybe I'm not allowed to do that while I have the pointer on, is that possible? Yep, that's possible. Okay. So we're going to look at the cell that is trying to transit mitosis. We're going to see it come out of mitosis. These cells are still linked by one of these DNA bridges. And you can see there are these flashes. There are these transient ruptures of the nucleus and all the nuclear localization signal will spill out. And then there seems to be some repair of that event. And then the, the, the protein can start to accumulate again. So there's kind of these cycles of ruptures 
and then repair events. Um, so this is just looking, in this case, this is actually a model um, where there's a dicentric chromosome. Um, however, one, uh, so one of the questions is, what's the consequence of this innate immune surveillance mechanism uh, when you have one of these ruptures? So you have these kind of transient ruptures of the nuclear envelopes, right? So the nucleus, we've come out of mitosis, it should be intact, but it's, it's unstable. And so here I'm going to show you uh, similarly cells, but these cells are actually now expressing um, a C gas that's tagged, and that's going to be in this panel here. And I just want to, again, point out, this is not just anaphase. This is far after anaphase. These cells have this bridge. They're trying to break their DNA and, and, and segregate it, right? Not break it, but segregate it. And what I hope you can appreciate is that late in this movie, um, all of a sudden what we see is that there's recruitment of sea gas all over this strand of DNA. Okay, so it's not something that happens in mitosis. It's far after mitosis. There is this bridge of DNA. It, the nuclear envelope was trying to form around it, but we get these ruptures and sea gases recruited. And this is a persistent bridge. I just want to point out, you also get this uh, kind of thing to micronuclei. Here's a micronucleus, and we can actually see that that micronucleus is intact, and then it's going to rupture, and then there's massive sea gas recruitment. Okay, so any of these losses of nuclear integrity, whether it's one of these persistent DNA bridges or it's a micronucleus, can recruit um, the sea gas protein. So um, I'm going to focus today on these DNA bridges, and I'm going to just give you the rationale for why that is now. Um, one of them is that um, actually many perturbations will cause both these DNA bridges and micronuclei, but there's evidence in the literature that DNA bridges are actually much more potent activators of CGAMP production. If you remember, I told you that recruitment of, of CGAS is not sufficient to activate it to generate high levels of CGAMP. Um, you know, why might that be? Um, there's evidence actually that one of the mechanisms that keeps cells from overreacting to its own genome is the fact that nucleosomal or chromatized DNA is a poor stimulator of CGAMP production. Whereas naked DNA, what you would have in a virus or a bacteria, is a far more potent activator of CGAMP activation. And so this would suggest that really the state of the DNA matters. And what I'm going to argue here is that actually micronuclei, for the most part, are chromatized substrate. It was a lagging chromosome that formed its own nucleus. It's unstable, but still it's nucleosomal. Um, whereas this DNA in these persistent bridges, as you saw in those movies, the DNA is being pulled apart. And so one of the ideas is that it, there's so much tension on the DNA that actually the histones that make nucleosomes are being evicted. And then the DNA that's left is naked. And, um, and that um, that is a more potent activator of CGAMP. And additional evidence from that for that comes from observations that APOBAC activity is actually very high um, over overstretched DNA that is present in bridges, which suggests that it can also become single stranded and acted on by APOBAC. Um, so that's just additional evidence that the structure in these in these persistent DNA bridges is different than what might be in micronuclei. Okay, and then last bit of cell biology before I get to our own data that I need to introduce you to is the idea that like in that NLS movie, there's also a nuclear envelope repair mechanism that is looking for these breaks in the nuclear envelope and trying to fix them. This is something that's been of interest to our group for a long time. Um, so remember, as I said, in a normal mitosis, the nuclear envelope has broken down, the chromosomes are exposed, but they don't activate the innate immune system. And then we reform the nuclear envelope at mitotic exit. When the nuclear envelope is reformed, you have sheets of endoplasmic reticulum around the chromosomes, but it's full of holes actually. And those holes are particularly where there are still microtubules from the spindle that are attached to the chromosomes. Um, so there's a machinery that has to come in and fix all of these holes at the end of every mitosis. And that machinery is made up of the components that I've shown here. Um, there is an abundant DNA binding protein called BAF, not to be confused with the chromatin remodeler BAF. Um, and this brings in a protein called um, LEM2, uh, which is an integral membrane protein. And at, that's shown here in the cartoon. So this LEM2 is recruited to these holes in the nuclear envelope. And LEM2 is an adapter for the escort machinery, particularly CHIM7, which is a nuclear envelope specific escort. So the escorts are a membrane remodeling machinery that basically can take a hole in a membrane and they can close it. And so this machinery is recruiting 
um, is recruiting escorts to the nuclear envelope. They form these spiral polymers and you need this to have one nuclear envelope at the end of mitosis. So this is the normal thing um, that's always happening. But there's abundant evidence that this same exact machinery is recruited anytime there's a defect in nuclear integrity. Um, and so I'm just showing you an example of this here. This is actually where a rupture in the nuclear envelope has been induced. And you can see that there's recruitment of this escort CHIMP7, as well as recruitment um, of sea gas, right? So one way of thinking about this, kind of similar to the P53 story, uh, you know, you can repair a, you can repair DNA or the cell can die and you can give up on things. Um, we have this machinery that sees a hole in the nuclear envelope. It can try to fix the hole, but if it can't fix the hole, there's this surveillance by the innate immune system. And so there's actually a competition potentially that's going on between these factors. And I'll show you some evidence for that in a moment. Right. So here is, and I'm just going to lay out why we've done the experiments that I'm going to describe in the rest of the talk. I've already walked through interphase um, and the idea of P53. So I just wanna make the argument up front for the hypothesis of a similar surveillance mechanism that's active post mitosis to surveil the integrity of the mitotic process. So if cells go into mitosis with under-replicated DNA, or unresolved DNA repair intermediates. These are things which we're going to see in an HR deficient cell, particularly one that's been treated with PARP inhibitors or chromosomes that are entangled. This will initially activate mechanisms that try to help segregate these chromosomes. This involves proteins like the Bloom helicase, um, the Pitch helicase, uh, Paul theta uh, mediated end joining, um, as well as other top isomerases. Um, but if those repair, uh, you know, those attempts to segregate chromosomes fail, then one of the consequences I've shown you is that you can have defects in nuclear integrity. And now the cell has to kind of decide what to do. So there's a nuclear envelope repair network. And so I showed you this bath lem 2 chimp 7 axis that, as I've mentioned, our group has worked on for a long time, understanding the mechanisms of, um, and that this can promote cell survival um, and possibly genome integrity. Um, on the other hand, if they're unable to repair these breaks in the nucleus, then this will expose DNA, this can activate sea gas, and perhaps this is the mechanism of cell death that is tied to mitosis and is tied to these observations of innate immune signaling um, that occur as a consequence of PARP inhibitors in HR deficient cells. And uh, I just want to point out that, right, we're going to push these further if we, any anytime we disrupt the checkpoint, right? So if cells are going into mitosis when they have not repaired their DNA, these are more likely to happen if you have an HR defect um, and if you treat cells with a PARP inhibitor. Um, the la very last thing I'll talk about is, is there a way that we might use this nuclear integrity defects as a biomarker um, of HR defects or of, of, con of context where PARP inhibitors might be effective? So I'll come back to that at the end. And also, might this nuclear envelope repair network be a new target, right? These are factors which actually limit the action, potentially, um, of agents that are driving these defects that we're using clinically. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm, now I'm just going to show you some of the data from our group. Um, this initial data is using, actually, an ovarian cancer model, UWB1289s, which are a BRCA1 deficient, HR deficient um, cell line. And um, so I'm just showing you an example of what one of these persistent DNA bridges um, look like. Um, this is, you can think of this as very much as the endpoint of that movie that I showed you that we also see uh, specifically in, HR, in this HR deficient line that's further precipitated by the addition of PARP inhibitors. Um, and so like in that example, you can see that um, this bridge, which is all along connecting these two nuclei, is highly enriched in sea gas. And so we would speculate from this that this is the region of the nucleus where the DNA is exposed to the cytoplasm and where we're getting um, sea gas uh, recruitment. And so this is just showing you here what happens when we treat with PARP inhibitor. Sorry, the, I've lost. Yes, here we go. Yeah, so the, on, the, on the left is just the UWB1, um, this UW1 cell line. And then when we add a lap rib, Interestingly, one of the things that we see is that elaborate increases the percent of cells that have these persistent DNA bridges. Um, but UWB1 cells have abundant micronuclei as many uh, tumor cells do in vitro. And actually this is not precipitated um, by PARP inhibitors, at least in this context. 
And so this is another reason why we're very interested in these bridges, because they seem to be the structure that's most precipitated by PARP inhibitors, whereas there's just a high rate of micronuclei um, all of the time, but that does not seem to respond to, to the addition of, in this case, a lap rib. Um, so um, we also think that for the vast majority of these persistent bridges that we observe in response to PARP inhibitors, that there is th that there has been a loss of nuclear integrity. Um, and so uh, one thing I just want to point out here is that you know, one challenge, I think, um, in general, is that you cannot see that, that these nuclei have a persistent DNA bridge if you just look at DNA stain because it's too thin, essentially, or there's something about the DNA structure that disrupts the ability of the DNA stain to intercalate into the bases, one or the other. We don't actually know yet. Um, so actually, in order to know that there's a bridge there, you need a marker for a bridge. And actually, it turns out that one of the best markers for a bridge is this protein called MAN1, which is a specific nuclear envelope protein. And so, you know, you can see quite beautifully that it is, you know, in the nuclear envelope of all cells, but it really nicely decorates these bridges. And so this has been a really important tool. It seems very simple, but the ability to see the things that you want to look for is, is pretty important. Um, so we've been using this antibody to this uh, internuclear membrane protein MAN1 in order to surveil this. And... Um, so we can then look at the coincidence of other factors on these bridges. And I wanna focus um, specifically on the other elements of that DNA repair um, pathway. So not only is, is sea gas recruited, and again, we, we, we interpret that as ruptured bridges, but there's also the recruitment of LEM2 and BAF. These are these factors that are involved in trying to repair these breaks in, in the nuclear envelope. And so this is evidence that that same kind of antagonism that I showed you in a induced rupture of the nucleus is also going on here. If we identify bridges using uh, this MAN1 antibody, what we can see is that all bridges have LEM2, which we expect those are two different internuclear membrane proteins, but more than half of them have C-gas recruitment. And so this suggests again, that the majority of the bridges that we detect are ruptured and that DNA is likely exposed to the cytoplasm. I also want to point out that one of the ideas in that nuclear envelope reformation is that there's local recruitment of LAM2 and these escort proteins to try to, to actually seal the nuclear envelope. And if we kind of zoom in, particularly on LAM2, LAM2 here, you can see that there are regions where there's a really high accumulation of LAM2. And so this is likely the region of this bridge where there's been a loss of integrity. And that kind of explains why sea gas is also seen in this patchy pattern, because there probably is a local effect. Um, and I'm just showing you here a line profile is just showing that there's specific recruitment of LEM2. This MAN1 protein, even though it's in a nuclear membrane protein, is kind of distributed throughout the bridge. And that it's not part of the same repair network as LEM2. So this makes sense to us. Um, I also um, want to point out that while though that work is in UWB1s, um, UDO in the lab has also been looking at uh, a, a model of BRCA1 deficient triple negative breast cancer. Um, and so these again are cells treated with a lap rib. This is just showing you the DAPI staining. I just want to, this I think is a beautiful example of pointing out that even when we can't really um, perceive these bridges in the DNA stain, these ones are a little bit earlier, so you can still kind of see faintly that there's DNA staining you can appreciate the changes in nuclear shape that are tied to this, just like those heart-shaped nuclei in that first movie that I showed you with the nuclear localization signal. So there's there's actually two hallmarks we think uh, that we can use as essentially I know proxies for the presence of these bridges. Um, one of them is the kind of orientation of these two nuclei, but the other is that there are these classic changes in nuclear shape that we see that are coincident with this. And this may become relevant if we think about whether we can use the prevalence of these structures um, as a biomarker, which is one of our kind of long-term interests. Um, this is just showing you that in this MDA436 line, preliminarily what we see is that there's a dose-dependent increase in the number of cells with these bridges in response to elaparib, whereas we don't see this in a different triple negative um, line that's BRCA1 proficient and HR proficient. So do, I've shown you this, uh, that, that we likely have these persistent bridges, they accumulate in the context of elaparib, they recruit sea gas, but is there actually activation of the innate immune pathway? So just to remind you that the canonical pathway is that sea gas produces CGAMP, which activates sting, which phosphorylates TBK1 and IRF3 and leads to interferon-stimulated gene expression. 
Um, so if we look at these UWB1 cells and the presence of olaparib compared to the vehicle control, um, we don't actually see uh, at the level of TBK1 phosphorylation much of an effect, but if we look at IRF3 phosphorylation, we see that there is a stimulation of the phosphorylation of IRF3. And if we look at the downstream consequence, which is interferon stimulated gene expression, just picking two of those genes, we do see that we can stimulate, we can see stimulation of interferon stimulated genes with the addition of elaborate um, in this cell line. And just to point out this, how much of a signal we get does depend on how intact the CGAS sting pathway is. And many tumors have inactivated CGAS expression, likely because there is selection against the pathway that I'm talking about. Um, but these cells do, as you can see here, they do express CGAS and sting. Um, but this is about as much stimulation as we can probably get in this line, because this is an experiment where we've just transfected DNA to drive an innate immune response. This is the two people use in this, in this field all the time. And we get a pretty similar degree of stimulation as we get with the elaborate treatment. So that may be kind of the top of what we can get in this particular um, cell line. So we do think, although this is only about a fourfold increase, log two fold change of two, that this is, that this is a pretty strong uh, response for this cell. Um, so does the, you know, does this res the response actually require um, CGAS that I'm showing you, this stimulation of this innate immune pathway? Um, so now we're just doing an experiment where we're knocking down CGAS, and you can see the knockdown um, by qPCR to the CGAS gene here. I'll just walk you through this. This is the same stimulation that we saw of these two genes with the addition of elaborib. If we now knock down um, CGAS, what we can see is that this does, to some extent, limit the activation. Um, but to what extent that is, we're not, we're not. We're, I would say where it's unclear yet whether CGAS is completely responsible. We're trying to be kind of very agnostic about what is lying downstream. And so one of the things we're doing is generating CGAS no knockout isogenics of these cell lines to really look at how much CGAS is important for this response and also, of course, for the cell death mechanism. One of the ideas that I set up was that this nuclear envelope repair network could be antagonizing surveillance by the innate immune system. And we have some evidence that that's the case. Um, so just to remind you, the idea is that BAF and this LEM2 protein come in to recruit escorts to seal these breaks in the nuclear envelope and this limits CGAS access and activation. So uh, here is an experiment where we have um, used siRNA to knock down the BAF protein to test this. Um, so again, here you can see the interferon stimulated gene and expression in a lab with elaborate treatment. This is again in the UWB1-289 cells. Um, interestingly and consistent with another study in the literature, if you just knock down BAF, you also get a stimulation of innate immune signaling, which suggests that just knocking down BAF and removing it can always stimulate some CGAS. And that may be as cells are reforming their nuclear envelope or some other aspect of the normal cell physiology. Um, however, if we now add a laparib, we can boost this even further, suggesting that there's a synergy, a synergistic effect of knocking down BAF and adding a laparib, which suggests that a laparib actually precipitates these kind of breaks in the nuclear envelope because of these entangled chromosomes. Um, and then normally BAF would be suppressing the signaling downstream of that event, but when it's not there, we get more um, C gas expression. So this is consistent with that kind of antagonism. Um, so I just want to show you um, just briefly, like, because it's just, you know, we're cell biologists, so we love to look at things. This is this um, really cool reconstruction of what one of these bridges looks up, like up close. And I bring it up because the protein MAN1, which is in yellow, is actually localized to the midbody. And the protein LEM2, which is that nuclear envelope repair protein, you can see along this bridge. But you can see they're actually in distinct regions. As I mentioned, LEM2 is likely to be along the regions of the bridge that, um, that are ruptured. And actually MAN1 is sitting um, on the mid-body. And so one other area that, um, that we're interested in looking into is there is a known checkpoint that um, controls whether cells do abscission that's down, does, seems to be downstream of surveilling whether there's been chromosome entanglements. And this is regulated by Aurora B which is interesting because the aurora kinases have also been interesting clinically, although I think have not been so far um, really uh, terribly successful clinically. But I think that this is one context where thinking about how aurora B might impact these events and be involved would be very interesting. Um, so that, and that is a reason why you get these doublet 
cells that are binucleate is because there has been an abscission failure downstream of the failure to segregate chromosomes. Um, and so that's something that we're interested in, in pursuing. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to come back um, to this idea that these nuclear integrity defects or, the, or and these mitotic errors in the nuclear integrity defects, um, could, this, could this be something that we actually take advantage of um, as a biomarker? So this is something that we're really, is very preliminary, but we're very interested in. Um, so, you know, as I've already pointed out, when you have these persistent DNA bridges, there is this relationship between the two nuclei that result from that mitosis, and there are these changes in nuclear shape. Um, these are actually um, H and E um, from the 10020 trial headed by Pat LaRusso, um, and uh, as well as Kurt Schopper. And one of the things we've been looking at is if we look at these tumors in patients that are BRCA deficient treated with Olaparib, um, can we see these structures? And I think what we've been, we did not expect to be able to see any of these structures in H and E, just to be honest, um, but, um, but we're kind of excited that we think that we can see these kind of arrangements that are between cells. You know, they were not the first people to ever comment on this, but I think we're connecting these observations to an underlying mechanism that may highlight why we should be paying more attention to the prevalence of these structures. I think particularly because micronuclei really cannot be perceived in H and E, this may be a, a mitotic error that's much more easy to perceive um, in the tissue. And so might this, I think, and one really interesting part of this to me is that, you know, these there's already an increase in these bridges just in HR defe defective cells that you can push further with PARP inhibitors, but this could be a kind of non-genomic way of assessing is there a homologous recombination or just DNA repair defect in this cell line? Because I see these mitotic errors that actually are such so large that they can be perceived even in H and E. To really validate that, um, we have to be able to actually, you know, convince ourselves that these really are the structures that I've been talking about that we see in tissue culture cells. Um, and so to be able to do that, we're working on validating some of the antibodies that we've raised to these specific nuclear envelope proteins. I mentioned it's really hard to see these bridges, even with DNA stain, you really have to have the right molecule that you're looking for. And we think that these integral and nuclear membrane proteins are exactly that. And so we're hoping to um, validate that these structures indeed are representative of these DNA bridges because we can specifically identify them uh, with these antibodies. And then in addition, I think just to be a bit agnostic also about other mitotic errors like my, micronuclei, um, LEM2, in addition to being recruited to the ruptured regions of DNA breaks, is also recruited strongly to ruptured micronuclei. And so if we had this molecular tool, we might also be able to more accurately um, quantitate the prevalence of micronuclei in clinical samples, which would be fantastic. Um, and you know why I think that's so important, and I just picked out one example, I could have picked out many of them, is that there, of course, is an interest in expanding PARP inhibitors beyond you know, breast and ovarian, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 deficient patients, right? So I've just pick and picked out one of these examples of the fact that there really are some amazing clinical responders. This is in pancreatic cancer. Um, here there has been selection for BRCA-associated pancreatic cancer. But I think anecdotally, we know there are triple negative breast cancers that respond to PARP inhibitors, even if we don't understand why there are right um, very aggressive prostate cancers, a subset of which respond to PARP inhibitors, even though we don't understand why. And so we're hoping that these kind of biomarkers could potentially indicate where PARP inhibitors might be effective, um, even when the molecular or genetic signature isn't understood. Um, okay, so um, just to just to restate um, what I've told you today, um, Olaparib enhances the prevalence of these persistent DNA bridges. There's already more in an HR deficient context, but you can push this further with PARP inhibitors, and this does lead to activation of innate immune signaling. Um, their recruitment of BAF and CGAS may be antagonistic, but both are seen to be recruited to these bridges, so that suggests that there, many of them have ruptured. Um, we're interested in whether dysregulating, disrupting this nuclear envelope repair um, network could actually further stimulate the innate immune signaling downstream of these uh, mitotic errors. Um, and we're excited about the idea that these persistent bridges could be an accessible hallmark um, of, of HR deficiency, which as I said, we poorly need. Um, in terms of what our next um, steps are and what we're focusing on at the moment, 
um, where we really need to understand if this is really the canonical um, ISG expression is relevant here, or perhaps there's some other downstream consequence that's running in parallel with the production of ISGs that's important. Again, you get cell killing in a tumor cell intrinsic way in a dish. So we don't know if that's really a consequence directly of anything to do with ISG expression. Um, and so that's something that we're exploring. Um, we're also taking uh, both candidate approaches and unbiased screens to identify what are the factors required for cell death in culture. You, in some ways, you would have thought this would have come out of CRISPR screens, which have been done, but actually, I think there are a lot of reasons to think that those screens weren't really set up to identify this mechanism, and so that's one of the things that we're um, setting up to do at the moment. Um, Again, we're cell biologists, so we're using correlative light and electron microscopy to really understand what's happening in these DNA bridges and also to uh, uh, and get information about the DNA structure. Um, we can do that by looking at accessibility to the TN5 transposase as an example, um, which is the basis for ATAC um, experiments, but you can use that in a microscopy-based experiment as well. And then um, we're working with our partners at AstraZeneca um, to really try to test whether we can use these bridges as a um, as a biomarker, you know, at very initial stages um, in a really well-controlled system. So one of the things that they have is that they have xenograft models of, of BRCA1 deficient tumors, which they've then treated those mice with a laparib. And so we have really nice kind of ground truth data of HR deficient, HR proficient, um, you know, with and without treatment with a laparib or other PARP inhibitors. And so looking at the H and E of those data sets and doing that in a blinded way will really help us to understand whether this is something that's gonna be worth pursuing. Um, all right, so I'd just like to thank the people um, who did the work and then I'm happy to take um, any questions. Um, we have a really great group working on genome integrity in the lab. Um, Yiduo is a, is a fellow. Um, much, of what, much of what I showed you today is work from um, AJ Kozak, who's a PhD student in the lab. Um, Carrie recently joined the team and she's going to be working on these screens for DNA repair. Um, so we're, we're, we're almost getting, uh, sorry, not DNA repair, screens to identify the, um, the mechanisms of cell death downstream of PARP inhibitors in these cell models. Um, and Anze just joined the lab and he's going to try to get our, our tissue part of this up and going. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Pat LaRusso, um, who, who has really been essential in, in all aspects of getting us involved in this direction. It would not have happened without her. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Yeah. Um, have you seen this cutting outside of the of one and other HR patients? Such as, um, what are you thinking? Yeah, I yeah, I think um, we have not um, some of the some of the data that I showed you from the literature is strongly suggestive that also in the context of BRCA2, you need mitosis to get cell death, you get innate immune signaling. We have not um, I should ask Connor actually, but I don't I don't even think Connor, we haven't stained BRCA2 deficient cells. So I don't think we've explicitly done that just because we've We've been focused more on BRCA1 in our lab, but um, I would be highly surprised if it wasn't the same in a PALB2 or a BRCA2 deficient line. And, and just to make the point, you know, others have also seen similar downstream effects, for example, of taxol treatment and actually have shown that, you know, um, tumor cells that respond to taxol have intact C gas stings signaling and those that don't do not. So that I think that it, this is not going to be even limited just to HR deficiency. It's just one of the ways that honestly taxol HR deficiencies of PARP inhibitors and, and even irradiation probably could all be stimulating the same pathway. Yeah. Um, yes. As a follow up, so I mean, if, if you're having inhibition of innate immune signaling, um, would these changes be potentially more sensitive to off limited viruses or kind of a, you know, as an alternative to false viruses? I think that's a great question. And I think that as you can see what we've done, we've completely ignored, right. Any of that, um, any of that crosstalk. And I, and I think it's, if you look in the literature, it's been kind of challenging and people who've tried to use this, even, even not even to the depth of what you just asked, but if you look at, you know, is sting actually, is sting signaling actually a tumor suppressive or a tumor driving mechanism, right? Because inflammation driven by sting has also been suggested to be a driver 
uh, right, is, is actually a tumor driver. Uh, CGAS, I think, and actually, if you look at the a number of tumors that have inactivated CGAS versus sting, very few inactivate sting. The vast majority have inactivated CGAS. If you just look across, you know, that map. Um, and so I do wonder if some of the signaling we're seeing is CGAS dependent, but maybe not strictly through sting or sting is more complicated because of its multiple roles. And I think that might be important to tease out to think about then how is this going to intersect um, with approaches like oncolytic viruses. So I think that's still one of the confusions at the moment, because honestly, there's very high profile papers saying, uh, you know, sting agonists would be great and sting agonists are terrible. And so that's probably gonna be context dependent. <laughs> oh. Go go ahead, I'll, I'll get the Mario and I'll get this up in the meantime. Are, are there about cell lines that are BRD deficient, where you could look at a lab rep in one of these cell lines in a immune compromise versus immune competent mouse to determine whether there's a role for the sting activation in, in the anti tumor activity of a lab rep? Because that, that would be an easy way to determine yep. uh, if, if the immune activation and immune activation. Is, is important or not. I completely agree with you. So I think that that is an excellent experiment and is an experiment that needs to be done. And it, you're right, it's it's obvious and it's achievable. Um, it's, it hasn't been what our expertise has been in, but I agree with you that that's exactly the right. So we really need some genetic models to be able to, to, to do that. So I, I completely agree. Um, Jeff has asked, um, whole exome sequencing is not as commonly performed as H&E but he's curious which degree of mutational signature derived from whole exome sequencing indicates effective homologous recombination or is being used as a biomarker. So to Jeff's point, yes, this is the only biomarker there is, is a kind of scoring, genomic scarring. But the challenge I would say is, and I think Jeff will appreciate this, is that the cell may be HR defective now, but then it may become resistant to PARP inhibitors because it's now HR proficient and it will still have the scarring left from the period where it was HR deficient. So that may help us to understand, you know, context where we don't have any reason to think someone has a germline or somatic mutation that they could benefit from a PARP inhibitor because we see that, but I'm not sure we're looking for that signature when there's no reason to be from the genomics already. So I don't think we're doing that. So we're not identifying those patients. So that's an access issue. We absolutely are using that when there's a reason to think that there is a an HR defect, um, but it can't tell us, it only tells us the history. It doesn't tell us presently what's happening in the tumor. And so I think that's the limitation. Thanks for the question. Bridges, are those all contained within cytoplasm, or do those potentially present kind of extra targets for antibodies or cars or something like that that would be unique to? I think it's a great question whether you ever, I, I think that there's, I don't think we ever see that the plasma membrane, right, actually ruptures. Um, although, you know, escorts also repair holes, temporary holes in the plasma membrane. So I won't say that we've actually tested that, and that would be really interesting to know. Um, whether that's the case. I mean, it's interesting that these same factors, actually man one in particular, were all identified as being autoantibody. They are all tied to autoantibody, to autoimmune diseases, as common targets of many nuclear proteins are, but I do think that that's interesting. And there's some evidence that um, that the LAM2 protein also probably in the absence of functional LAM2, you do have kind of a, a prevalence of autoimmunity, which would be consistent with you know, not being able to do this normal cycle of nucleoglomerular reformation does get surveilled through this mechanism and, and can be deleterious. Um, so I think it's, but yeah, we, we don't really, what we see is that, it, you know, likely eventually most of those cells will give up. And I think it's just a, just to highlight, this is why one has to be careful in assessing in this area, particularly um, fax profiles, looking at cells that look like they're G2M cells, because you get these cells that are G2M cells, but they're actually in G1, and that's because they failed in cytokinesis, so now they're 4N, but they're actually no longer mitotic, and so that's one of the things that we see here, um, so it'll show up in experiments. All right. Thank